Well, welcome everybody to Getting to Know BC. This is the Career Services and Pre-Law Program webinar. It is uh, great to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, first off, we hope that you and your loved ones are both healthy uh, and safe uh, during this time and want to wish a warm congratulations to the class of 2024 for your acceptance to Boston College. Uh, my name is Pete Caruso. I'm an Associate Director of Undergraduate Admission. I'm joined by my colleague in admission, Stan Zatkowski, who's a Senior Associate Director, um, as well as our presenters I'll be introducing uh, to you in a few minutes. Um, this is the last weekend of our Get to Know BC webinar series, so you may have participated in one of these programs over the past several Saturdays. Uh, we have also featured a number of webinars and Zoom meetings of the BC community uh, featuring various members of the BC community, alumni, Boston College students uh, during the month of April. Uh, like this session, those have all been recorded, so you're welcome to view them if you haven't done so uh, on your admission student portal. You know, usually at this time of year, we invite uh, families back to campus during this time for admitted Eagle Days, but uh, given the pandemic, as an alternative, we have been holding essentially what is an admitted Eagle Month. Uh, so, uh, so grateful for members of the BC community who have been part of these events, as well as you for taking the time to view um, these programs. Um, our two presenters today uh, are normally uh, a, a, a vital part of our on-campus admitted student events and uh, great friends to the admissions office. Um, we'll hear first from Joe DuPont, who's the Associate Vice President of Career Services, um, and then Sal Cipriano, who is also Assistant Director of Career Education and the Pre-Law Advisor and a Boston College undergraduate in 2010 and a Master's in 2011. Um, they'll each speak for 20 minutes and then we will answer your questions for about 10 minutes or so. Um, just so you know, we have turned off the chat function, but you are welcome to type your questions um, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we will be happy to address those. So uh, thanks again for joining us, and I will turn it over to Joe. Thanks, Pete, and thanks everyone for being with us today. As Pete mentioned, my name is Joe DuPont, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Career Services at Boston College. And I'm so excited to speak with you today, along with my colleague, uh, Sal Cipriano, who will be talking about the pre-law portion um, of today's presentation. So I really did wanna thank you uh, for spending time with us. I know you have a, a lot of choices, as I'm sure you've heard many different times. This is the most selective class um, in our history in many ways, so congratulations to you. And we're really here today to sort of add to the puzzle and help you decide you know, whether this is a really good fit for you. Is BC the place you can see yourself? And are we giving you the ed type of education that um, you really want? And clearly we think you're a great fit. Um, that's why we have admitted you to the class of 2024. So um, I'm really, really excited uh, to be able to talk to you today for a little bit, maybe answer some of your questions and then you know, pass it off to my colleague, um, Sal. So first of all, in the, I always like to do this in the spirit of full disclosure to all of you out there, um, I think I, I understand where you're coming from in, in ways maybe I didn't even just a few years ago. I have two children in college now. As you can tell from the t-shirt, my son, Zach, on the left, uh, goes to Boston College and he's a sophomore and loves uh, all sorts of sports and other activities. And my daughter on the right, the older one, Sarah, is at a school and graduating this year as a senior. And then Maya, um, the bottom one, is a little bit older now, actually is looking forward to going to college and perhaps BC at some point. So. Again, we really do, I, I think I sense like how important this is in a way that I haven't been able to before. And we understand that no matter where you're looking, the idea of how any college can help prepare uh, your daughter, or your son uh, for life after and have successful postgraduate outcomes is really important. So um, let's you know, take it away with that. The first thing I'd like to focus on uh, very briefly is give, kind of give you a little bit of a roadmap of our presentation, then I'll, I'll tell you slide that's immediately in front of me. So I think it's important, and I'm sure you've heard this several times, is really to think about what makes a Jesuit education distinctive, what makes a Boston College education within that distinctive. So we'll share a few things uh, for you to be able to um, get a better sense of that. Um, we also want to tell you about how our approach works. You know, what do we in the Career Center do 
um, in order to make sure that, you know, we're making sure that students have a great career education and come out of here real, really well prepared. Um, I also want to share a couple of facts and figures. I know that those are really important and I'll, I'll reference where you can find the rest of those on the website and highlight some of our programs and services and then, um, you know, share a little bit more with you in terms of um, next steps if you want to follow up with us and answer any questions. So I think it's important to start with this slide because for people like me who went to college 20 or 30 years ago, you know, you wouldn't normally see career framed this way. And a lot has happened in terms of career. And I think, you know, for the better in terms of how high a priority is on campus. So I think it's really important to take a look at this slide and really think about what our mission is. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more, more detail about this. A couple of things that we want to emphasize are the words empower. Um, we have lots of resources. And again, I'll share all sorts of great data with you in a few moments. Um, but our goal at the end of the day is to help your sons and daughter become you know, lifelong learners. And so the skills and the talents that they use here, the experiences that they have, and the way that they grow will help them do that you know, moving forward. And we'll be here for them after they graduate too. We are the Centralized Career Center. We are here for everyone. That's what I meant by all academic disciplines there. Um, we want everyone to feel prepared and comfortable and confident and have some clarity um, throughout their BC experience in terms of how we can be helpful to them and what they can do in terms of their lifetime. Um, also, you know, pursuing a meaningful career in life. We, we juxtapose the two. Um, work is a really big component of how much people spend their time. And this idea of having a Jesuit impact and having an impact on the world in whatever way you choose to do it um, is really, really important. And work can be a really big part of that. So we like to think of those two things as hand in hand. So um, we'll take it away from there. The other thing I think is really exciting for us as a career center is because you'll hear a lot if you haven't already about these Jesuit values. Um, you might have even heard these questions in different presentations about what brings you joy, what are you good at, and what does the world need you to be. And from a career perspective, they align really, really well with our work in terms of you know what are you good at, what skills do you have, and what are you interested in doing. And so when schools talk about how career is an institutional priority for them. Um, as we do, it's really helpful you to be asking those questions to yourself and to people at those schools, like how does that actually work? What does that really mean? And I'll give you some examples today throughout our presentation, but just the fact that we as a Jesuit institution are aligned in terms of asking these big questions, which also translate to very practical concerns and what, what can I do when I graduate here? It can be really, really powerful. So we wanna emphasize that. Um, you know, as throughout the presentation and beyond. Um, we also want students to be able to use their gifts and talents, right, in the world. And as I said before at the beginning, it's just really important for us to be able to show students and parents and their families that for us, it's not study what you love or get a job. It really is a yes and, not a either or. You can study what you love and you have to put in some work in terms of career, um, and our students do incredibly well. So I wanted that to sort of, for you to understand that for us, a career education is really just an extension of their BC experience and the experience they're getting here elsewhere. In terms of our model, um, I think it's important for what, you know, as you're making your decision, one thing when we talk about institutional priority is, is staff size. So our office, not because staff size in and of itself, but I think it, again, it illustrates the commitment that the university has to making career education a priority. We have a full-time staff of 19 people in our one office. We have five additional graduate students, 10 peer career coaches, 10 other student workers, and we have eight to 10 other career professionals around campus. So that's a group of about 50 people in this one area that are dedicated to helping your sons and daughters achieve their goals. And I think that's really important for you to think about and for us to be, I feel really grateful to be in this environment. In terms of our structure, you'll see um, BC, no matter whether you go to MCAS or a specific, specific school like Lynch or CSUN or CSUN, we are liberal arts um, in, in all shapes and sizes in addition to that practical training. So we do have a lot of students who are exploring what they wanna do. And it's really important for us 
when we think about how we model our work, to have a team that's specifically dedicated to helping students figure out how does my academic major fit into what I want to do? You know, where, not even thinking about a job, what skills and values and interests do I have? And can I articulate them in a way that helps me discern and figure out where I want to be? So we think it's very important to have career coaches who are, um, you know, sort of masters of that. Um, but we're also very excited about and, and completely understand that students want very tailored information too. Um, so we are organized by career cluster, which I'll share uh, in, a, in a moment, the specifics of that. But it's essentially that our counselors or coaches like Sal are really up to speed and they pick an area that they want to focus on in terms of what are the hiring trends look like in that area? What does uh, recruiting look like? What are the first jobs and experiences that people have and how can they get better uh, prepared in that way? So it's the sort of marriage between those two um, that is really important. The other thing I'd just like to point out is um, our students love learning from other students. So we do, we do a, we have a staff that's fantastic about making our students part of our, what I would call our, our staff. Um, and they do a tremendous work for us and are really great about marketing our programs and people, bringing people to the office. So we wanted to mention them as well. So that's in, in terms of the overall structure. In terms of the clusters that I mentioned, um, just I'll just take a moment to take, let you take a look at this. So they're pretty broad intentionally. They represent the different areas of, of the BC experience and the different ways that students can study on campus. Um, again, students want really specific advice. Um, so it's great if I'm interested in biopharma that I can go see the healthcare coach. Um, that's something that's really important to us. Um, the same thing with terms of like, there's such overlap at times between these different specialties and people can go back and forth between who they wanna see. It's completely up to them. I do get comments every once in a while about like where is something like entrepreneurship and the way that we've structured our work is BC is pretty well known for entrepreneurship and we have an entire center. Uh, so that's infused throughout all these different clusters. So again, the general, um, then something that's a little bit more specific. So you have a sense of how we organize our work and we think it's important for our staff to develop expertise in these particular areas um, so they can give the best advice possible to students and help them accordingly. So that's in terms of our structure. Um, and I wanna give you just like some facts, you know, some curious facts. We told you a little bit about our approach, but I always think numbers sort of give you a sense of context about size and scope and perhaps even success on some level. Um, and then, you know, we can kind of fill in the gaps there a little bit as well. So the first thing I wanted to point out is last year, we had about 6,000 undergraduates come to our office. Um, now this is unique individuals. So this isn't the total number of contacts. The total number of contacts was uh, with the Career Center last year, there's about 23,000. So again, when we talk about career as an institutional priority, and none of this is mandatory, students opt to come see us. We had about 60% of the undergraduate student body uh, participate in our programs, come see a career coach, go to a career fair, go on a job trek, all sorts of things. So the appetite for this work is really high and, and students are seeing uh, value in what we do. And this is again, when we talk a little bit about you know, size, and scope of offerings, why it's so important, because we know this is really important to students and their families. The other thing I'd like to point out, and we have a great outcome site, I'd really encourage you to take a look at it. Um, I'm right on the Career Center page, it's one of the first tabs. We have all sorts of interactive data that you could manipulate in all sorts of different ways to see placement rates by major, by school, um, salary information. Um, career clusters as we identify them, and even geographically where students go. Our students do really, really well. I feel very fortunate to be able to work with a student body like this. Um, these trends in terms of employment have been going up, if you're interested, for probably the last you know, 10 years, um, and you're seeing less people go to graduate school. Again, this is a snapshot in time, it's just where do they immediately go? Now in the you know, era of COVID-19, who knows how that will, that will change over time. Although we have to keep in mind that your daughters and your sons are you know, four years away from that. 
but I think it's really interesting to see the percentages of what BC students do. We know a little bit more than anecdotally, but not enough to put on a slide, that about 50% of our students go on to graduate school within five years. I think that's important for you all to know as well. Then in terms of value, I would say a couple other you know, fact points. We always get questions about it. Are, are there internship opportunities on campus and, and beyond? And that's one of the fortunate things about being in the Boston area. Our students do all sorts of internships and experiential learning. Um, so this slide, and, and I feel very fortunate that we don't run this data, our institutional research arm does. So I think in, in some sense it even has more credibility. Um, so about 86% of the students you know, do at least one internship, about three, 33% do three or more. And this is just internships. This has nothing to do with research, lab work, community service, you know, running student clubs, all sorts of things that employers want to see. It's a very engaged student body. We have employers and alumni who really want to engage with students. So um, we're very fortunate um, that there's a lot of opportunities for people. And I also think this statement below is important too. Um, again, this, the, all this is asked by institutional research and the fact that we have so many students who graduate and point to a specific resource at BC that was helpful in terms of helping them secure their employment or their graduate school next steps, I think is telling in terms of, you know, can that office provide value? Is it gonna be helpful to, my, to me or to my son and daughter, depending who's on the call? Um, just things that you might wanna think about as you're making your choices between schools. A couple of things I wanted to point out here um, that you might just, again, these are illustrative. I just wanna give you a little sense of some of the programs that we have. You can see all sorts of great information about them on our, our website. Something that's pretty unique to BC is we have a program called Endeavor that, again, all optional, no costs associated at all, that predominantly sophomores, but anyone can come to. It's a three-day program over winter break. Um, about 300 students came to last year. It's at the end of the winter break. Um, and it's a combination of career coaching by our staff on the first day. We bring about 90 alums back. Um, on their own dime, they're not reimbursed. It shows you a little bit more about what they think about BC, and they they're coaching the students in those industry clusters. Um, you know, what want to learn more about consulting? What better way to learn about that than speak to a panel of consultants and have lunch with them and hang out with them all day? And nursing and business, and you you could just fill in the the blank teaching, whatever it happens to be. And again, when you think of a program like that, and there's tons of information on the website. Talk about um, career being an institutional priority. We, you know, put this on, but the, you know, Rest Life team has to let them come back in early. As I mentioned, our alums come back, take vacation days from wherever they are. Um, we have people come back from all over the country. This has really become a signature program. We have, last year, we had 18 job treks on the last day of this, which are usually hosted by our alumni um, in Boston. So it's a really vibrant way and just one illustration uh, some of the things that we do to help our students make that marriage between career preparation and real world experience. Another thing that we do, and Sal runs this program, he's done an incredible job, is we are very fortunate enough to have approximately $250,000 uh, that we give away annually so students can have summer internships, um, including right now. Um, so this year, this is moving forward. Um, you know, in a more virtual format. But again, we think it's really important when you think of that exploration piece for students to have options. So students get about uh, $3,500, depending on um, the work that they want to do. Um, and it allows, just removes a little bit of a financial barrier. So if we say go explore theater or nonprofit or the arts or a business that doesn't pay or journalism, whatever it happens to be, we want to make take the little sting out of that and make it a little bit more possible for them. We also have an incredibly robust alumni job shadowing program, about 100,000 working alums. We have about, so students can do that on any you know, given day through the programs that we've set up. And we have a very formal one set up at the end of May um, where about 400 students have opted into. Um, so we're really excited about where after school ends, you can just go you know, shadow an alum again, all over the country. Um, and this year, obviously, it will be virtual, but we're pretty nimble when it comes to that stuff. 
last year, to give you context, we had about 12 career fairs and networking events. Our largest career fair last year took place in the fall in County Forum, over 2,000 students, about 160 employers. And what I really like about this is, again, there's just so many opportunities for BC students. I can't you know, emphasize that enough. And in terms of being nimble, um, and we've, since COVID-19 hit, we've actually had two additional career fairs, um, very successful. One was a collaboration with our partners in the SEC and the ACC with 194 employers. So lots of different you know, flavors, just to kind of give you a sense of the size and scope of what people might be doing. And then I just wanted to you know, point a couple of things out. I think as you're, you're thinking about your choices, one of the things that you want to think about is how nimble and creative you know, people can be. And we really pride ourselves on that. We, we are always trying new things. They don't always go well, but um, more often than not, they do. So we can't predict the future. So I think one of the things you might want to look at is how creative and responsive a school is. So very quickly, the, one of the, here's just three small examples of how we have you know, shifted gears quite quickly, I think. Um, Handshake is a provider we're moving to that's gonna be able to us show even more jobs, with lots of geographic diversity for our students. So we're really excited about that. That's being implemented in the next couple of weeks. Um, I love this program that we just came up with in the last couple of weeks. Again, partly in response to COVID-19 is something called Helping Hands. We have about um, 9,000 students and alumni who have joined a mentoring platform that we launched called Eagle Exchange. The numbers grow daily. And the whole idea, a student virtually raises their hand and an alum can see and then offer them either you know, career advice, a project or something to work on, especially at this time when internships are virtual or in short, short supply, which is really important, or they can give them job referrals into their company. So it's really, we're so excited about this program. Another thing we're excited about is is Praxis, which is gonna be launching in another week or so. And this is a way for students who are at home, particularly freshmen and sophomores, but this year even more, to kind of do a self-guided autonomous career development program over the summer. So when you know COVID-19 does end, they've made some progress. And also they can, you know, employers and others will be asking, what did you do uh, during this time frame? And we want to give people all sorts of ways uh, to continue to get prepared. So we're very excited about this and I'm very grateful um, for the staff and the students that I work with. I know we, you know, we have certain time limitations here. So um, I want to congratulate you again. And I'll just take a, a break and you know, move on to the question slide and give you an opportunity to ask things. Clearly, you know, as like all BC offices, if you have questions after this, um, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, we have on our website our direct lines and contact information, et cetera. So thank you. Great. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Joe. Uh, we did have some questions that came in as uh, people were registering for the webinar, as well as a few that have come in while, while you were speaking. One of them that came in while you were speaking, they just wanted to make sure they heard what you said correctly, that uh, over 30 percent uh, or there are 30 percent of the students that do internships uh, might do three or more that's right that is correct okay yep. and regarding internships along those lines do most of those get um, organized through the career center or is it done through faculty contacts or departments or combination of both it's a combination and that's very intentional. And when we talk about this being an institutional priority, we consider ourselves almost sort of like the conductor of the orchestra. We wanna create opportunities throughout campus and beyond, whether it's alumni, employer partners, faculty we work very closely with, and our office in order to kind of make career an institutional priority. So that is a very intentional thing that we do. Okay. And let's see, another question that came in uh, is from a student who is uh, going to be enrolling in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, but is also thinking about doing a concentration in management. Uh, how does someone with that background or inclination, how are they serviced by the, the Career Center? They're serviced by us, so all students can come to us. Um, students who are in CSOM, 
and other schools, they have their own little career shops too that we work with. But there are, we have about 700 students who do exactly what that student is thinking about. Um, and we work hand in hand um, with our colleagues across campus. So that's kind of fun. Um, a lot, they're getting these nice, you know, concentrations in business and a very broad liberal arts, um, you know, discipline as well. And employers and grad schools love that. Okay. And you can definitely tell this, this next question comes from a potential freshman parent. Uh, how inclined are freshmen to come in and use the resources of the Career Center? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it depends. So, we, we really try to meet people where they're at. So for example, for some, for some students, it's, you don't need to come in. I mean, the real, the real important thing is to get adjusted, to do well academically, to get involved. Um, that's the most important thing. I think it's sort of liberating to know because we have all these opportunities and people who work with us and we're really blessed with this great alumni network, you don't have to rush. Like that said though, and that's important preparation, we have students who are contacting us. If you're on work study, we work with those students before they even get here to formulate their resume and help connect them to work study jobs on campus. So our most, a lot of our staff are academic advisors and we really like that. Um, so we get to work with students kind of making connections between what their degree may be and may not. So a lot of it really depends on the reason that they're coming. And that's what a lot of students just wanna know. Like sometimes, and I would do the same to my children, is like go to the Career Center. Unless you can sort of tell them why, you know, give them a, the why behind that to either help you with a document for your work study job or to, um, you know, help pick classes or just to ask any questions that you have. And that's why their peers really come in. Students love seeing peers, especially when they're a little unsure at the beginning. Um, but we do, like I said, we do, we do see a fair number of freshmen. And if uh, especially in the second semester. And what I often tell parents is if they come to us once in their freshman year and they're adjusting in all these other ways, that's, that's pretty good. Okay. And another question about internships. Uh, you mentioned the program that your office sponsors in terms of uh, fellowships, but are most internships uh, paid credit pretty well balanced between the two in terms of remuneration that a student might receive? Yes. So, especially now because there have been, you know, there's different laws that have been put in place that have sort of tampered down on a lot of unpaid internships, but there are ex exceptions too uh, for smaller organizations or nonprofits or things that I mentioned, uh, but most come with academic credit or some form of pay. Now we'll see what happens in the next couple of you know months because of what's happening now with the economy, but um, I don't foresee too much change in that area. And a lot of departments, and you can ask this uh, of the specific part department you're in too, um, give you know academic credit for internships and really want students to take advantage of that. Okay, great. Uh, looking at the clock, we're getting about halfway through our webinar. So to keep things balanced, <laughs> I'd like to bring uh, Sal in on the uh, discussion at this point. Uh, Sal is a career uh, educational uh, advisor and specifically works with uh, uh, the pre-law program. So we're just going to switch screens here and have him come on and do a presentation about uh, the pre-law advising program at uh, BC. All right, hello everybody. Um, Joe, thanks for that great intro. Um, it's really great to be able to spend part of your Saturday uh, with you all. So as I already mentioned, my name is Sal Cipriano. Uh, I'm a BC alum, a double Eagle, two degrees from the school. Um, I'm also a Long Islander. So if anybody out there is from Long Island, um, welcome. I look forward to meeting you hopefully one day in person. Um, I'm an assistant director of career education in, at the Boston College Career Center. I oversee the government law and public policy career cluster. Joe had mentioned that there are several clusters, uh, industry specific, with industry specific focuses. I focus on government law and public policy uh, broadly, but in that role, um, I also serve as the university pre-law advisor. Um, I love it. Um, I think uh, it's just such an enriching experience. Um, Boston College calls students to be people for others. And for me, it's great to see students who are interested in legal careers, how they translate that uh, into a passion 
to help others uh, via uh, legal engines. Um, I like to start this presentation out with this quote. Uh, it's from the American Bar Association is that there's no single path that will prepare you for legal education. Students who are successful uh, in law school and who become accomplished professionals in the law, they come from all walks of life and from all educational backgrounds. Um, students are admitted to law from almost every academic discipline. Um, and I really want to emphasize that. And that's kind of the mantra that encapsulates uh, my approach to pre-law at BC um, that also kind of coheres to the, uh, the Career Center's mission as well. Um, we recognize that students who may be interested in a legal career, uh, they come from a diverse array of backgrounds, um, and they have, many different, uh, they have many different reasons for wanting to potentially pursue a legal career. Um, so therefore, what's imp most important for me is to help those interested students pursue their interests. Um, regardless of how relevant, quote unquote, it might be to a legal career. Um, this could mean majoring in something that on the face of it might not have any relation to law, but at the same time means, if it means that they're pursuing something that they're interested in, they're still going to be developing those passions and those skills that will be fruitful for them in a potential legal career. Um, ultimately, um, and this is again the way that pre-law operates for me at BC is that so long as one is genuinely pursuing their interests, they are going to be preparing themselves well for law school. So pre-law, what does it mean to be pre-law at Boston College? Um, so unlike a pre-med track, uh, there are no set majors or course requirements or plans of study to be a pre-law student. Again, you can major in anything. You can be in any school, whether that's CSOM, MCAS, CSOM, the Lynch School, uh, Woods, um, again, you can major in anything, be in any school, and you could be pre-law at Boston College. Um, if you are interested, you can register and declare as pre-law um, at Student Services, which is in Lyons Hall. Uh, but again, there's absolutely no requirement to even do that. Uh, you can go to law school and you don't even need to declare as pre-law. Um, pre-law is a statement, essentially a statement of interest at Boston College. Uh, but if you do declare as pre-law, um, what you will happen is that you will receive a bi-weekly email from me, a newsletter that will have news, events, resources, all sorts of opportunities that you're encouraged to take advantage of. Um, I also tend to share important updates from the Law School Admissions Council about deadlines and important announcements. And so, you know, in light of everything that's going on right now, there's been major changes to, for instance, like the LSAT. Um, so it's been really important to communicate those to students who may have been taking the LSAT this spring or this summer. Um, so that's a key kind of channel where I can communicate with interested students. Um, but again, regardless of whether you're declared as pre-law or not, all students are welcome to meet with me throughout the year. Uh, to discuss their interests and this, to discuss their applications. Um, and truly, this means any student, any student. Um, from a freshman you know, who may be potentially interested in a legal career uh, to a senior who's in the thick of applications. Um, I love reading law school personal statements. You know, I kind of come from an academic background, so I really enjoy delving into students' writing to think about you know, their reasons for going to law school. I never have a problem taking the red pen, of course, in a very nice way uh, to students' writing, but it, it always comes in a sense to make sure that students are putting their best foot forward uh, because BC students are fantastic and I know that they strive for the best and I love being able to help them do that. Um, as a side note, um, oh, actually not necessarily a side note, but also a really cool program that BC has uh, and particularly for MCAS students is what's known as the 3 plus 3 program with BC Law. Um, this allows students, uh, this is for MCAS students only in um, if they uh, can apply to Boston College Law School in their junior year, and um, if they're accepted, they would actually start law school in what would have been their senior year. Um, so essentially, this allows MCAS students to attain their uh, bachelor's degree and their JD, JD from one of the top law schools in the country, too, um, in six years as opposed to, to the customary seven. Um, I mean, there are major advantages to this. Um, it, in particular, it's one less year of tuition uh, that you would have to pay. 
Um, at the same time, right, there is other things to think about as well. It's very competitive um, uh, program, so there's no guarantee that students would be admitted, but they're always welcome to reapply um, post-graduation. Um, I've worked with several students over the past year or so who've applied to the program and happily report that two uh, that have been admitted. Um, again, it's very competitive, but it's been really great to see students grow, um, grow in this program and, you know, go to a great law school um, right down the road from us, uh, down Com Ave, uh, come the fall semester. Um, if anybody has more specific questions about the 3 plus 3 program, I can get to those a bit later, but um, it is a really cool program, but it is also a big decision uh, for students to make because it would mean going to law school after your junior year as opposed to down the road. Um, but ultimately, um, my goal and my role is, is not to try and just funnel students to the best law schools. That, like, that's going to happen in the sense that BC students are great, they're dedicated, and they're going to go to great law school. My, my job is to make sure, and the Career Center as a whole, is to make sure that, you know, we help you make the best choice. If that means going to law school, that means, you know, going to the law school that's best for you. And maybe that means not going to law school as well. As, so long as your decision adheres to your interests um, and, you know, you're allowed, you're able to pursue what you're good at and what you're passionate about, that in the end is what matters most to us. But as I kind of mentioned, um, we regularly host events um, and let students know about opportunities to explore the broader legal world. Joe mentions um, in his presentation, we have an awesome program called Endeavor every January. So this past January, we were able to lead TREX uh, to engage with BC alumni, broadly speaking, in the government law and policy field. Um, this included a trek to the State House um, in Massachusetts, as well as um, a trek to Ropes and Gray, which is a major law firm uh, headquartered here in Boston. I actually got to lead it. If you look closely, you can actually see Joe's son in there, uh, in that picture as well. But, uh, and, you know, beyond being Ropes and Gray, having some awesome uh, alumni there who were really, who were really engaged with students and uh, who really, um, you know, showed us a really good time and what it is to be uh, an attorney at a major law firm. They also had, without a doubt, the best offices at the top floor of the Prudential Center in Boston. So it was a really cool uh, experience for us all who got to go. Um, we also um, have a very strong and tight-knit alumni community. Um, I say that both as an alum and now somebody who gets to work regularly with alumni. Um, we hosted, for instance, in February, an Ahana Alumni and Law and Policy panel. Um, it, was, it went over great. Um, it was great to um, invite a number of alumni who work in the legal community now, uh, who graduated both recently and you know, more than 10 years ago to give their perspective about law school and working in the legal community. Uh, just two weeks ago, we had a women in law and policy alumni panel uh, over Zoom, which was very well attended. Um, it really comes down to the fact that BC alumni work in a range of different careers. And the ones who I've gotten to work with closely in my role as pre-law advisor who work in the legal community, absolutely love engaging with students, love being a source of information and a source of opportunity for Boston College students. So having said that, there are a number of different ways to get involved. Um, in law as a BC undergraduate. Um, we have two fantastic pre-law student groups, uh, the Bellarmine Law Society and the Ahana Pre-Law Student Association. Um, I work with both of them closely. Uh, they are inclusive of all students, no matter how pronounced or how limited their interest in law is. Um, we host events, we host application workshops. Uh, there, we provide ample opportunities to network with legal professionals. Um, they're great. They make my job a lot easier. Um, and they're, they're, they're just have such a great student group and they're so strong um, that they're constantly putting on a number of great events and creating a really great sense of the pre-law community at BC. Um, throughout the year, and especially during the fall semester and application season, we also have a number of law schools that visit campus. Um, and so, um, as, I, as I illustrate here, just on this slide, um, we had a, lar um, a large number of students attend uh, a, a number of different law school info sessions. Uh, these info sessions are not only for students who are currently applying. Um, they're for all underclassmen to learn more about specific law schools, to network with law school admissions representative. 
Um, it also gets their thinking potentially about their applications a bit earlier. Um, you know, networking with law school admissions representatives is an essential component of the law school application process. So I'm really happy that we get to have so many law schools come to campus, campus to engage specifically with BC students. It helps that we're in Boston, right? There are a number of really great law schools like right in our backyard. Um, and so there's lots of opportunity for BC students to get a feel for some like, really amazing law schools. Um, to get a sense of what they're looking for, but also to ultimately decide like which law school might be for me, whether I'm applying now or maybe whether I'm thinking about it down the road. Um, as Joe mentioned, BC students also undertake an array of internships, uh, and this is also true for the legal, political, and governmental fields. Um, on the screen, you'll see just a few of the examples of places where, uh, that I pulled where students uh, undertook legal related internships in summer 2019. Um, I actively work with students to find and secure these opportunities. Um, legal in but, but it's important to note that a legal internship is by no means required. Uh, for a to, for, to go to law school. We think back to that ABA quote that I shared earlier, um, you know, you can, so long as you're pursuing your interests, so maybe that's nonprofit work, maybe that's working in a museum, whether that's education, that is ultimately what matters to law schools um, down the road. They want to they get application from applicants who have pursued their interests, no matter what that might be. Having said that, an internship in the legal field, whether it's in state and local government, whether it's at a law firm, whether it's at a nonprofit, this is a great way to decide if law is right for you. Like you could have, like your exposure to law may have just been conversations or coursework. So a legal internship um, can be a way for you to test the waters. And for many students, it's, yeah, this is great. You know, I, this is really confirmed for me that I want to go to law school. For others, it was the opposite. It's like, nope, you know, I did it, don't want to do it again. And that's fine because ultimately that will allow us to make sure that you are uh, pursuing your interests in the end. Um, so, and even now um, with everything that's going on, um, I'm happy to report that there's still a number of students who are undertaking some fantastic internship opportunities, um, including those who will be undertaking some internships um, with the assistance of the Eagle Intern Fellowship that Joe mentioned. So I'm really impressed by the resiliency of BC students during this time um, to, like, to know that they are continuing to uh, pursue their passions. Um, so I also want to share um, some facts and figures with you uh, about where BC students uh, go to law school. Um, I think either Peter or Stanley will be sharing out um, a, a slightly more detailed resource sheet uh, with you all with this information on it. Um, but I did want to, you know, go over quickly with you all that, you know, BC students, they go to, they go to law school anywhere and everywhere. Um, you know, we, ha we have um, BC applicants to law school that those include seniors, um, right? So those who are applying straight out of Boston College, as well as alumni. Um, and I do work with many alumni who have graduated within five, who graduated within five years um, on their law school applications. And so, you know, there's probably upwards of, you know, 100 individuals that I work with uh, throughout the year from the beginning of the law school application process right on down to like where we are right now. You know, yesterday I had some great conversations with people weighing decisions like, hey, I got into Georgetown and NYU and, you know, how do I, how, how am I going to figure out which one is for me? Um, and so that's an awesome conversation to have, right? Because that person is going to be going to a fantastic law school um, and I get to help them, you know, figure out which one is best for them. Um, and, but as you can see from here, um, you know, the top locations for BC applicants to law school, and I'll say applicants, because again, that means current students, but also uh, alumni, you know, certainly in New York and Massachusetts, uh, Boston College Law School is the top destination. It's where we said where we have the most applicants. Uh, but again, as you can see here, we we truly do send them all over. This uh, the map on the left uh, is illustrative of the top 25 uh, law schools that BC students or BC alumni matriculated at um, this past fall in fall 2019. Um, you know, again, our top locations are in Massachusetts and New York, but also our Jesuit and Catholic uh, peer institutions like your Georgetowns, your Notre Dames. Um, we have a great uh, pipeline to those schools as well. 
um, as well as the T14. You know, rankings aren't necessarily everything. Um, the right law school, the best law school, is always relative to the applicant. Having said that, we do send some, we do send students to some re really fantastic law schools as well. Um, and this is just kind of a proves just how strong the BC liberal arts education is as a great prep for uh, these opportunities. Um, you can also see here that BC's applicants um, do very well in getting in uh, and they're well above the national average of being admitted to law school. Um, so again, my, my role is to help you explore um, and to help you decide if law school is right for you. And if you do, is to help you get into the law school that is right for you, um, no matter what that law school is. Um, and you can be confident that, you know, should you choose BC ultimately, one, I'd be very happy to work with you. And two, you know that, you know, you'll have some great resources to take advantage of. Um, so with that, I'm going to just leave this slide up. This is kind of just broad information for the Career Center that you can use uh, to uh, connect with us. And uh, whoop, let me stay on there. And um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions in the time that we have left. Okay, hey, uh, thanks, Sal. Uh, some did come in <clears throat> while uh, you were uh, speaking, and one in particular had to do with uh, your early comments about there's no set major that would necessarily make you any more attractive as a, as a uh, pre-law student or applying to law school, but are there certain courses or areas that you would encourage a student to consider um, outside or within their majors that would be good mm -hmm. courses to have if you're thinking about pursuing law as a profession? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, and I, and I truly do stand by that. There, you can major in anything and go to law school. Um, having said that, there are definitely a number of courses at Boston College that you can take. Um, you can kind of break it down into two facets. One are courses about the law, and one are courses where it will help you improve your skills. For law school. And actually, if you go to bc.edu slash prelaw, we have some of those courses listed. Um, on the skill side, really anything, any course that's getting you reading, writing, thinking critically, um, and researching are going to be helpful. Um, you know, that's, that's in, so that's a lot of your liberal arts courses and your social sciences and your humanities majors uh, in particular. So your histories, your Englishes, your poli size, um, there are any courses within those disciplines will ultimately serve as good prep. Uh, but having said that, also courses like logic, public speaking, um, you know, those are great ways to also prepare for law school as well. Um, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, but I had, in a, two weeks ago, when we had that women in law alumni panel. One of our alumnas, she mentioned how her senior, like she knew she wanted to go to law school and her senior year, she actually took an acting course because she knew she wanted to do law, but she was terrified of public speaking. So I thought that was like, that's really interesting. That's a really great way to build a skill that you know um, would be helpful for you in a legal career. Great. On the other side, across like political science <laughs> and history in particular, as well as the business law department in CSOM, which, uh, MCAS and uh, Lynch students are more than welcome to take those courses. There is courses about the law, um, which can serve as great prep. Also as a great way to explore, like I'm interested in law, let me take a course to see if this is truly good for me. Okay, good. Um, a lot of questions about the uh, three plus three program. <laughs> yep. uh, <laughs> popular, hey, I can do it in six, not seven, great, let's do it. Um, there was one in particular where a student was planning on being in the Morrissey College, mm -hmm. uh, might pick up something in the School of Education as well. Would they still be eligible to be considered for the three plus three? I think so long as they are an MCAS student primarily, um, that's what matters because you do need to finish your MCAS major by the end of your junior year. Um, I will kind of just broaden this up and says that it is kind like the program is still relatively new. I think we're only into year five or six of this and we've had two students so far go into it. And like I said, two students were admitted this year. So it's very new, but it's also very competitive. Um, and so, but just kind of broadly speaking, so long as you are, you meet the credit requirements and finish your major by the end of your junior year, 
you would be eligible to apply. But again, it's a full on application. So that includes, you know, taking the LSAT, that includes writing a personal statement, letters of recommendation, and BC is an elite law school. So there's no guarantee that you're getting in. Of course, like I will be there to help. Um, and the BC law admissions folks can be the biggest help here as well. They love working with Boston College students, but also once your application is submitted, you're another applicant. So you get uh, reviewed um, impartially, uh, just as you would for any other law school. And on the, uh, the LSAT, uh, what type of specific support services do B does BC provide, uh, do they mm -hmm. provide in preparation for the exam? Yep. So uh, there is a course. So BC has a test prep um, service that does the LSAT as well as a number of other um, standardized tests like the GMAT and GRE and so on. Um, it does come with a fee and, it, and it's offered periodically throughout the year. Um, but, my, so, but my way of going is that um, I really enjoy actually having these conversations with students who are in the preparation phase because I, I really like to help you figure out the best way for you to study because law school is expensive, but also applying to law school is expensive, right? And so um, my, my goal is to help you realize what would be your best strategy, whether that might be taking a course, whether that is you know, studying on your own. Um, I, I could certainly point you in the direction of some great resources that would be low cost or free that can help you really excel on the LSAT. Okay, we just got one more. And this was a sort of a, a final question. Um, on average, what is the number of students that <clears throat> tend to uh, enroll immediately upon graduation to law school from BC? Is there an average every year or is that fluctuating like any career? It fluctuates, um, but let's put it this way. So if we, if we think about some of the numbers, so over the past few years, I would say anywhere from about 55 to 70 seniors apply straight to law school and probably a, so like to start law school right after college. Um, and then anywhere from like 150 up alumni do that. Um, and if we kind of do it on the reverse side, um, you know, every law school is different, but it's kind of, 60, 40, 70, 30 incoming classes of people who took time off versus people who come right out of college. Um, and that's not to say that you're at any disadvantage um, if you wanna go to law school right after college. That's really just a symptom of more people are taking time off to work or to explore their interests further before they go to law school. Um, and it, but for me, it comes down to apply to law school when you wanna to go to law school. Um, so if you want to go to law school right after college, and that means applying your senior year, let's go for it. Um, and I'm happy to report that every single student who I've, who I've worked with um, is going to law school uh, this uh, starting in the fall who applied. Um, and it's great because this is, makes the spring, which has been a really difficult spring, at least really exciting uh, for some people. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And I, I guess... The final question I, I will pose to both uh, Joe and Sal, uh, and maybe as sort of a concluding statement from your perspectives, pre-law advisor, director of the Career Center, what would be one major piece of advice that you would give to that entering freshman student? They arrive on this campus, the slate is clean. Uh, what would you encourage them to do within the first week or two of their experience on campus? I would encourage them just to try to make close connections with friends and pick classes that they really like, especially as they're getting acclimated to school. There's so much like buzz and noise going around your head. Presentations like this show that there's so many resources out there for BC students, because there are, that it's okay to pause and make sure that you're putting yourself in a really good position to adjust socially and academically in order to have long-term success. I echo that, and I'd also say as an alum, and also as a first-generation college student, um, getting onto campus your first few weeks of freshman year, um, it's totally different, but it's like, it's so cool. And like, I would just say, explore, challenge yourself. This is something that's so new and so different, and BC's got a whole lot to offer. Um, so I, you would be remiss if you did it. I mean, really, like there's a lot of opportunity out there. There's a lot of ways to 
to try new things and to challenge yourself. So that those would be my two biggest things for sure. Great. Thank you both. Uh, Pete, any final comments from your sure. position? <laughs> thanks, Dan. I wanted to uh, thank, uh, thanks again to Joe and Sal for their uh, great insight and information today. Uh, just wonderful resources. And, um, you know, as we wrap up, um, we know that we're entering into the final week before you make your uh, admission decision, uh, with May 1 being the candidate's reply date. Um, so if you have any lingering questions, uh, you're more than welcome to contact your admissions counselor, uh, which can be found on your admission portal. Um, we also have several additional webinars uh, live that are featuring BC students and alumni um, that we'll be uh, doing this week. Um, so I want to thank you again for joining us today. I uh, want you to stay safe uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of your weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.